Good afternoon, it's Monday the 27th of March 2017, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News, I'm your host Brian Gerrish, with me in the studio Mike Robinson. I think we just get on with the news today because um, as we often say, it's incredible what is taking place in this country. Um, well, uh, recently we had the release of uh, from WikiLeaks of the Vault 7, which was uh, the hacking capabilities of the CIA, included malware, viruses, Trojans, weaponized, zero day exploits, and so on. This is what they're saying. Uh, malware remote control systems documentation that went alongside that. Uh, and what was interesting about this release was the actually very low key re uh, reaction from the public. No one was terribly surprised. Uh, but what was perhaps surprising about it was that it certainly gave evidence um, that the that so-called end-to-end encryption services such as WhatsApp uh, continue to remain unhackable by the security services. And as a result, uh, the Vault 7 releases show that the security services have been needing to hack endpoints, and that's phones, tablets, uh, and laptops. So they can't just capture network traffic over the internet, decrypt it, and use it. So it should come as no surprise then uh, that the government is hoping to use momentum from the so-called Westminster terrorist attack to convince people that government should have a back door available to those encrypted services. Uh, and of course, Amber Rudd was on the Andrew Marr show on BBC yesterday. Uh, she said, it's completely unacceptable. There should be no place for terrorists to hide. We need to make sure that organization, uh, organizations like WhatsApp, uh, and there are plenty of others like that, don't provide a secret place for terrorists to communicate with each other. Uh, it used to be that people would steam open envelopes or just listen in on phones when they wanted to find out what people were doing legally through warrant. Uh, but in this situation, we need to make sure that our intelligence services have the ability to get into situations uh, like encrypted WhatsApp. So this came out because apparently the uh, alleged terrorist um, was had give, sent a WhatsApp message just previous to, uh, just prior to, to taking the action that he did. Um, and uh, well, it looks like the uh, government intends to use this Westminster event to press forward with justification for their blanket surveillance regime. Um, and uh, so what are they going to do? They've clearly decided that they can't make, excuse me, can't make encryption services illegal. Um, and so the only option they have is to argue for a backdoor into the systems. Um, well, of course, it wasn't that long ago that um, the TSA in the United States, um, they had a master key for all the locks on their uh, on their, uh, any locks, any padlocks they had on any of their, their storage. Uh, and unfortunately, the design of that lock uh, leaked onto the internet, as these things tend to do. And before they knew it, people were printing off with 3D printers, the keys, master keys for these locks. So, you know, this is, uh, doesn't end with government having the keys to uh, WhatsApp, because uh, the risk is that it actually uh, leaves back doors open for others um, to access people's yep. information. So um, we should be absolutely refusing to allow the government to uh, proceed with this. But there's, there's, Mike, there's no substance to this. We, we've got uh, a so-called um, terrorist. We don't know a lot about him. Well, we did know a lot about him because he was on MI5's books, but they didn't really know much about him because he wasn't a threat. Now we've got an event and what's immediately come off the back of this event is that we've got to spy on every aspect of society. Yeah. Nobody's asking the key questions, who is gonna be doing the spying and what sort of people are in control of those spies? Are they the people that we should be concerned about? Uh, Amber Rudd, does she know what she's doing? I think she's a bit of fluffy nothing. She is simply there to carry out the policy. She thinks she's being very clever but she's building a prison camp that she's also going to be tied up in. Um, absolutely. Uh, and so here we go. Uh, this is a photograph, obviously, from Ruptley. Uh, apparently, they have, uh, they have built these, um, these bollards and, and, well, what are these things? Are they there eventually to put tur turnstiles on? Um, but this is, uh, this is on the way into Westminster City. Uh, there's no possibility of getting... Uh, in with a car, it seems, uh, because they're, they're building these things to prevent any kind of similar events happening so again. So these, these have just popped up over the last couple of days? Uh, well, they started building these uh, the day following the incident. So that's some pretty good design and development work, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. Or they, were these already on the books because they knew what the event was going to be? That's 
more likely, in my opinion, because uh, where did they magic these things up from? Yeah. Uh, and what was interesting is uh, on on Friday, uh, the uh, the traffic cameras were all switched off, so there were no live feeds in the area, so nobody could see this stuff being installed. Wow. Um, we just see the results of it, uh, and I'd just say because you know various people saying that uh, uh, the bollards, the barricades that have popped up. Uh, that they're not very, they're, sorry, this is a quote from somebody uh, from Rupley, uh, Derek, a Londoner. Uh, they're not oppressive and they're here for our security. It doesn't stop people going about their normal daily business, but it does help stop any terrorist attacks such as the ones in Berlin or Westminster the other night. Well, I would say to Derek, um, I grew up with this, um, which was the uh, entrance to Royal, Royal Avenue in Belfast. Uh, all the main entrances to the streets in the centre of the city in the 1970s and early 80s um, had turnstiles where you had to be searched, you had to queue up to be searched, you had to be searched going into every single shop um, and uh, of course it was for the same reason because uh, it was to prevent allegedly the IRA uh, leaving car bombs in the centre of the city. This was far from being not oppressive at the time. Yeah, uh, and, so, so we've got the same system, but because we've painted it yellow and given the image of something in a children's play area. Uh, and we haven't installed the turnstiles just yet, but clearly capable, there are mountings yeah. on there that are clearly capable of, of holding yeah. them. So, uh, you know, th this, is, this is only the thin end of a wedge. And no debate in Westminster that I'm aware of as to, uh, to these extra security. We suddenly just had an announcement within a few hours of the terrorist attack uh, so-called terrorist attack that we were going to increase security in London and there may have to be some form of barrier restrictions and then we have a weekend passes and in it in it's it's already installed yes remarkable it, it's remarkable we can be so efficient at installing barriers and so inefficient at building nuclear power plants indeed yes uh, okay here we go um just a, a quick mention of this. Independent are claiming this as a, a, as a, a scoop, uh, but basically they're saying that uh, um, when they were attempting to get from uh, Turkey, the Turkish, uh, the Istanbul airport to the UK, one of the airports where you're not supposed to be allowed to take uh, in-flight laptops, uh, basically they found themselves in an area on the air side uh, where they were able to freely mix with people getting off other aircraft. and. Uh, I mean, they're quite rightly saying that this makes a complete mockery of the whole thing. Well, the whole well, thing's a nonsense in the first place, but there Well, you, go. you can also see this with different airports, Mike, because um, pick an airport, San Francisco, no problem with your laptop. It stayed in your bag, not really interested in it, not asked about it, not just for myself. This was other passengers going through. And then you try and take a laptop on a plane up to Scotland and uh, then this becomes a big issue. Mm. Some airports, you need to take your belt off, your shoes off, others you don't. Um, so there's no common sense rhyme or reason to it. It's only, um, it's only for show, <laughs> if, if that. But anyway, go ahead. Well, let's move into this little area because um, if we want to know what the changes are in society, the government is now starting to tell us very clearly uh, this was released in the last couple of days from the House of Lords, Stronger Charities for a Stronger Society. Um, I wonder what the comment of um, child abuse survivors would be uh, to that statement in its raw form, uh, because, of course, many of those people say, well, they laugh if you mention the main charities, NSPCC or Bernardo's. But here we are from the Lords, Stronger Charities for Stronger Society. And it, <clears throat> excuse me, it says we're living through a time of pro profound economic, social and technological change and the environment in which charities are working is altering dramatically. We do not believe this is a temporary aberration. Uh, here's the language. Such disruptive changes are likely to become the norm. Well, that's very interesting. How do they know that, Mike? And uh, uh, this is unlikely to be a temporary aberration. Such disruptive changes are likely to become the norm. Um, they can only know that because that's the intention. Uh, that is the intention. And of course, it's been solely the UK column that has pointed out people talking about the need to have active disruptors in society. Um, we featured some time ago the uh, TED video 
uh, with a man from a North London council, might have been South London council. We'll call it up again. It was Barnet. Barnet, thank you very much. Uh, so a gentleman from Barnet Council on stage being filmed talking about future government and the fact that we needed more disruptors in order to get the necessary change through. So here we've got the policy. The policy is of disruption in order to get the government's change agenda through. What's the change agenda? Well, luckily, this uh, Baroness is going to tell us. Uh, so here we are, Baroness Pitt Keithley. Uh, these are some of her comments in respect to the report. Charities are the eyes, ears and conscience of society. We need stronger charities for a stronger society. Uh, wouldn't it be the case if you had a strong society, you wouldn't need charities because you wouldn't have people who were poor or um, suffering or... That's absolutely true. Charities are the eyes and ears of society, yeah. Brian. Did that remind you of anything? Well, are charities becoming uh, replacing GCHQ? Is that what's going well, on? Well, I think that's part of it. But uh, eyes, ears uh, certainly uh, made my ears prick up because I remembered this. This is Leeds Advisory Group for Common Purpose. This is the meeting going back to uh, 25th of July 2006. And just for an indication, here is a charity. Uh, common purpose. Uh, we often say this is an oxymoron because, of course, they're a political charity. Here are the sorts of people common purpose we're bringing together. So we've got a regional director of common purpose. We've got a divisional ch chief superintendent from West Yorkshire Police. We've got newspapers. We've got the university. We've got the council. Uh, we've got businesses. We've got people from education sector all meeting behind closed doors under Chatham House rules of secrecy. So the two that really stick out are the, the policeman and the newspaper man because uh, those two organisations should be kept separate from any of this nonsense. Indeed. So separation of powers gone out of the window under the control of a political charity. Why were we so interested in this particular meeting? Well, it was this statement. Introduction of new advisory group members. The group and new advisory group members were welcomed and introductions were made. Claire went through the advisory briefing pack and reiterated that they are not a board, but the eyes and ears of common purpose leads and will feed key business information to the director. They're there to assist with recruitment by spreading the word, putting their own staff on programmes and making decisions on accepting participants in matrix. The advisory group should also act as a support, uh, as support in localizing the content of the curriculum for matrix. So think of those orders being given to the very senior policeman there, that his job is not to be a policeman, it's to work for business information for common purpose. And what, what do we see here? We see an excellent look into very, very dangerous activity by, char by the charity Common Purpose. But of course, this is mirrored across many other charities as we, we see. Uh, here's the lady, Claire Bennett. Uh, you can find her on the Common Purpose website. And according to the, the information, um, she's very experienced, design and delivery of leadership development in the West and North Yorkshire area, design and delivery of courses for emerging leaders, youth courses, uh, on it goes. So I don't know where she got all this experience. She's been working for Common Purpose for years, but this is the lady who was simply pointing at uh, policemen, senior policemen, and saying, this is what you will do in order to support Common Purpose. So let's come back to the Baroness and see what else she had to say. She says, charities are the lifeblood of society. They play a fundamental role in our civil life and do so despite facing a multitude of challenges. Yet for them to continue to flourish, it's clear that they must be supported and promoted. So what's coming here? Well, it's pretty simple because if you're a charity, you're not going to be allowed to, to act as a charity unless the government is supporting and monitoring you. Uh, she says, we found that charities lead the way with innovation, but this is a risk of being stifled by the contract culture. 
And while advocacy is a sign of healthy democracy and is a central part of charity's role, this role has been threatened by government. Now, this is itself uh, an interesting statement. What she's getting at is the fact that many big uh, charities, Bernardo's, NSPCC, for example, are now doing the work of government. So they are running contracts. They're no longer effectively charities in, in the sense that most of us would remember. So big contracts, she says, are causing charities problems. So run on through. Uh, we hope that charities will be encouraged by this report, that the government will respect their role and that in addition it will value the connections charities have with all sections of society and encourage the vital scrutiny they provide. So what we're interested in here, Mike, is the fact that the charity sector, that's about 167,000 charities in UK, representing well over £44 billion, those charities affect everyone. They uh, affect local communities, very small communities. The government now getting the control in through those charities. Right. So, so what Baroness Pitt-Keithley is uh, expressing here echoes what uh, Priti Patel was talking about last week, where yeah. they're going to uh, fund particularly smaller charities. They're going to give them grants. Uh, but in order to uh, achieve that grant funding, uh, they have to agree to special training. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, and of course that that is that is the control. The control. Okay. Um, so let's have a look at uh, Mike's um, hit that absolutely on the button. So let's just uh, put a few things together. This report was itself reported by Third Sector magazine. Very good article. Encourage people to go and have a look at it. And uh, it says that basically. Um, Charities are going to be encouraged to report to government on how they perform and they're going to be encouraged, as Mike says, to do training uh, for the government. So why should we be interested in all this? Well, in that article, this is one of the organisations mentioned, the New Philanthropy Capital, um, and they say we've seen our approach adopted and adapted as far afield as Brazil, Germany, Sweden and Israel. So we now get a clue that this is not UK uh, internal policy. There's something much deeper here. And why would we be interested with new philanthropy capital? Uh, well, if we look at who created it, it's Goldman Sachs, the very same bank that's uh, busy helping the British Army to train at the moment alongside Barclays. Uh, so back to the... Um, where are we? Back to this one again. Let's have a look at another aspect to this article uh, because we've got power to change mentioned and uh, we've got a gentleman called Christopher Stevens. Uh, he was chairman of the Judicial Appointments Commission. So we've got a nice mix here, Mike. Uh, one minute we're talking about charities. We then have a look at the interest of the senior people involved and they're busy appointing judges and at the same time, they're part of the salaries board, the uh, salaries review board for the top civil service commissioners who are going to give them the money through the government in the first place. But there's no conflict of interest, luckily. None at all. None at all. Um, so what else can we add to this one? Uh, well, in the article, it also mentions Lloyd Bank Foundation. Uh, so we've got another bank coming in here uh, just to make sure that... Uh, uh, we know who's controlling who. So um, pretty obvious that uh, the banks are well into this scheme. This is power to change. Uh, what do they say? No one understands a community better than the people who live there. We work with community businesses to revive local assets, protect the services people rely on and address local needs. Is that, is that assets in the sense of intelligence gathering? Uh, I think that's exactly what's going on, that they are trying to get people to believe they're coming along to help the local uh, children's football team that needs some help refurbishing their ground. But if you have a look at what's going on here, massive data collection. And um, we shouldn't be surprised because, of course, it was this gentleman, um, Eric Pickles, who said uh, that we are going to shake up the balance of power in this country 
we're going to change the nature of the constitution. Mm. Um, now, he said that alone, no debate. He said he was going to be a revolutionary and the revolution was going to start here. So what we are really seeing coming in now is this central core of big society. Um, this diagram was we did years ago, but it showed the change agents driving through the third sector to produce this common purpose based big society. And this is going to be, uh, well, you, you talked about this the other day, Mike, this is uh, Theresa May. She's calling it the shared society, yeah. but it's exactly the same thing. We're just using slightly different language. So again, this is a constitutional change, localism, Okay, the localism bill has gone through, it became the Localism Act, uh, but that's quite constrained and limited, uh, whereas most of this change seems to be pretty much unlimited um, and no real debate in Parliament about what this change is, where it's taking us. Certainly no debate in Parliament about Eric Pickles suggesting that he's a revolutionary. Um, and so there are quite a number of areas of policy where there seems to be stuff happening that has not arisen Ever been from debated. A debate in Parliament. Yeah, and this, of course, is because there is effectively no Westminster. We simply have the Cabinet Office with its special advisers driving policy. We're going to have a look at a bit of that in a minute. And backbenchers are simply, well, they're simply puppets sitting on the side. Um, well, at the end of last week, um, Sergei Lavrov, uh, the foreign minister of Russia, was speaking to the general staff of the military academy, uh, and uh, sorry, the military academy of the general staff, I should say, uh, and he was talking about Afghanistan, uh, and he was describing it as an example of uh, the United States' long-standing policy of what he was calling managed chaos, um, and uh, and he he absolutely singled out drug trafficking as an example of this. He said uh, the US operation against the Taliban and Al Qaeda was supported by all countries. Uh, it's another matter uh, that after receiving the international approval, the United States and its NATO allies, which took over in Afghanistan, started acting rather inconsistently, to put it mildly. During their operation in Afghanistan, the terrorist threat has not been rooted out, while the drug threat has increased many times over. The drug industry prospered. There is factual evidence that some of the NATO contingents in Afghanistan turned a blind eye to the illegal dra drug trafficking, sorry, even if they were not directly involved in these criminal schemes. Afghanistan is a separate case, although the current developments there, which are a result of the NATO operations failure, despite the carte blanche the bloc received from the international community, can be considered an unintended cause of managed chaos. In Iraq, Syria and Libya, this chaos was created intentionally. Well, I have to say, Lavrov being typically diplomatic, perhaps, um, let's just remember the situation, because while Afghanistan was in the hands of the Taliban, opium production dropped to almost nothing, uh, and, uh, and the, the acreage was, had dropped to almost nothing. Um, once NATO troops moved in, opium production skyrocketed, far in excess of the levels of uh, the year 2000. Uh, was that a coincidence? Well, Lavrov doesn't think so, although he's being rather gentle by suggesting that it was merely people turning a blind eye. Uh, NATO claimed uh, that images of Western troops r sort of running around in the poppy fields would force uh, for farmers into the hands of insurgents. Um, so that's why they wouldn't do it. That was what they said anyway. Um, but of course, uh, as we said, the Taliban regime, which ran uh, Afghanistan in 2001, just before we moved in to root them out, uh, had pretty much stopped uh, the opium production. Um, but let's just remind ourselves of what uh, this gentleman said, John Walters. Uh, he was, uh, this was a memo from the US Office for Drug Control Policy, uh, and he had met with uh, General Mitchell, uh, the commander of International Security Assistance Force. That was the sort of, uh, he was the overall commander of the NATO operation, I guess, at the time. Uh, and McNeil told Walters there had been uh, a lot of action on counter-narcotics, but little progress. He was particularly dismayed by the British effort. They had made a mess of things, he said in this memo in Helmand. Their tactics were wrong. The deal that London cut on Musakala had failed. We'll come on to that in a second. Uh, and that the Musakala agreement opened the door for narco-traffickers 
in that area and now it was impossible to, to tell the difference between the traffickers and the insurgents. Now the, the Musa Kala deal that was mentioned in the memo was an agreement with the Taliban that our troops would pull out of key drug trafficking areas, for example Musa Kala, in Helmand and in return the Taliban agreed not to attack ISAF forces in the region. Uh, but the result of that was that the drug traffickers had free reign to do what they wished uh, and uh, insurgents eventually regained, regained full control of the area. Also, let's not forget this Afghani MP, uh, Nazime Niazi, who's saying as long as foreign forces are present in Afghanistan, the cultivation, production and trafficking of drugs will continue in the, uh, in the country. Uh, and uh, even uh, towards the end of last year, we reported uh, this latest report from the UNODC, poppy production up 10% since 2015. Uh, eradication, which is the key thing, was down 91%. There's really no excuse for that unless what you want is to see more opium on the black market. There's no other, there's no other explanation for it, really. So eradication down 91% since 2015, yield up 30% since 2015. And as uh, France 24 reporting here, uh, the fact that Afghanistan now producing multiple harvests every year. Uh, and let's remember this quote from an Afghani opium farmer. I can't remember where I got this from now, but it, it basically saying opium is money. Why should we waste time growing wheat? Um, and uh, we should also just remember the irony that, uh, of course, British farmers are growing opium in this country at the moment because the NHS cannot find enough uh, opiates for painkillers. Uh, on the markets. So we have to grow opium in this country, despite the bumper harvests from uh, the uh, from Afghanistan. Um, so I think Lavrov being too soft, focusing on the United States, possibly not the main perpetrator here, perhaps Britain is the main perpetrator, perhaps the City of London financial centres and institutions that are benefiting from the drugs money are the main, uh, the main perpetrators here. Certainly. Yes. And isn't it remarkable that at the moment it, it's UK column, it's other so-called alternative media outlets, which are talking about the reality of this. None of these statistics appearing on the BBC or any of the British mainstream newspapers. Why would that be? Ignorance, uh, inability to research. There's some questions to be answered, I think. Yeah. OK, and then let's move on to Yemen. Uh, well, there was actually a protest over the weekend in London. Uh, on the situation in Yemen. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't seem to be hugely big. Uh, so two years since the beginning of the Yemen conflict, Saudi Arabian jets uh, bombing Lebanon, Lebanon in, oh, sorry, what am I talking about? Yemen in, in you know, to death really. Uh, and so on Sunday, what uh, RT here describes as dozens of protesters met, meeting at Marble Arch uh, near Hyde Park to show solidarity. I would say that if anybody's organizing uh, an event like this, uh, we'd be very keen to hear about it and give it any publicity we can. So uh, please uh, let us know. Um, and uh, so what was interesting was that the demonstrators decided that they would march towards the BBC offices uh, with uh, End Yemen Siege and Hands Off Yemen on their placards and so on. I didn't see the BBC reporting this particular protest. Um, so there you go, it's up to RT to report it. Um, despite the fact they ended up outside. But uh, a better turnout in Yemen itself. Millions of Yemenis, certainly hundreds of thousands, if not a million, uh, protesting two years of Saudi murder, according to this tweet. Um, this was in Sana. Uh, so well done to, to them. At least they're getting out. I would say we need to get a lot more people uh, doing something about the situation in Yemen because this war, underreported, absolute disgrace, particularly because we're helping uh, by providing Saudi Arabia with the uh, with the weaponry that they need. Well, of course, Mr. Fallon has said that the objective of uh, Britain's defence policy is not only to uh, help defend the world, but it's to sell those arms and munitions. Um, yes, indeed. But of course, we're doing better than that because what's happening, Oxfam here uh, reiterating the fact that what we're looking at in Yemen is, uh, is famine, extreme famine. Uh, lots of people, uh, you know, millions of people, seven million people on the brink of famine, according to Oxfam. And of course, that gives Britain the excuse that they need to send in the uh, uh, British controlled NGOs uh, with, uh, with international development money uh, to make, bring about change in Yemen. Um, so uh, we, uh, 
we get to follow our, our foreign policy objectives uh, by bombing the country into the Stone Age and bringing people to the brink of starvation. Uh, in the meantime, of course, Saudi Arabia not wanting to uh, uh, improve the situation. Uh, this photograph sent to me uh, yesterday uh, about with the result of Saudi Arabia bombing Sana Airport, one of the main uh, areas where food is coming into the country because, of course, Yemen has always imported its food supply. So uh, the airports and the ports either being blockaded or bombed to bits, uh, preventing uh, food getting into the country. Um, and I'll just end with this, which I thought was really spectacular hypocrisy from Sky News. Um, civilian casualties are abhorrent, to be, but to be expected. He's talking about Mosul in this case, um, but of course it's absolutely unacceptable um, whenever we are liberating, uh, or whenever a, a city is being liberated. In the case of uh, Aleppo, of course it's acceptable, unacceptable for, uh, for uh, any civilian uh, casualties at all in that situation, but when it's Mosul and it's us bombing, uh, then it's, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. yeah. So uh, unbelievable hypocrisy here. Um, weren't we supposed to have had Mosul sorted out by now? Uh, Wasn't I, it all supposed to be all part of a peaceful state and much better because we've got in there and, and bombed most of the infrastructure to pieces, uh, but now it was going to be okay in 2016, 17? Absolutely. Uh, perpetual war. Who, whose advantage of that? Well, the West and the City of London. Yeah. So uh, where can we go from that? Well, who is controlling Britain? We don't think it is uh, anything to do with elected politicians. Uh, what we see on a daily basis is increasing control over Britain's politicians, whether it's the Prime Minister, members of the Cabinet or other backbenchers. And as we consistently say, the um, uh, child abuse is the engine of politics in Britain. Uh, but who else is operating behind the scenes? Well, we picked up on this um, mail article here, uh, which is talking about the um, internet uh, giant Uber. <clears throat> and this story is all about uh, the provision of taxis in London. So the mail says Cameron Osborne, their glamorous chum and the great Uber stitch up the disturbing links between number 10 and the online taxi firm as it's revealed one of its major investors now has the ex-chancellor on its payroll. Well, this was an interesting article, but I believe that the mail simply didn't get to grips with the right part of the story. Just before you go on to the main part of this, is that another job that George Osborne's got then? Um, uh, well, he's, he's somewhere in the major investment part of that, right. uh, Mike. I didn't focus on that because to me, that wasn't really the important part of the, the article. And... One of the key things about this story is that it's talking about uh, traditional taxi drivers in London being wiped out because this American company can come in and call up taxis much faster, much cheaper than they can do the job, even though statistics say that the number of, of Uber's drivers who've been involved in some form of sexual offence with passengers is really quite high. Um, so what sort of things were said? Well, were said within days, um, the paper saying, I can reveal the deputy head of Cameron's policy unit, Daniel Korski, had been assigned to lead secret crisis talks between the mayor and his senior staff and a range of ministers and Downing Street figures. Korski orchestrated a series of meetings about Uber during October, November and December this last year, according to emails and other, document and other documents released under the Freedom of Information Act and obtained by the mail. So um, basically, um, David Cameron, George Osborne pushing for support for Uber. And uh, when people started to ask what had been going on and why, they started to block the freedom of information requests. And then uh, Ms. Korski was used as some form of heavyweight. Well, he's the man that I was interested in because who is he? Uh, well, luckily there are some pictures. So we've got one here with his, uh, Mr. Korski and his partner, Fiona Mc. Uh, Elwim, if I pronounce that correctly. Uh, he's described as the Prime Minister's shadowy hitman, uh, but it, in this article, he's gone for the career of um, uh, John Langworth, who was the um, chairman of uh, the British Chamber of Commerce. He was apparently a little bit too anti-EU, so in came Daniel Korski as the heavyweight to 
uh, tell him what to do. Well, who is this young man? Uh, well, this is where it gets really interesting. Use Wikipedia to get a bit of basic information, but you discover that he's been working for An Andrew Mitchell MP. He's also been uh, working with Catherine Ashton, very interesting person. Uh, he's apparently Polish, uh, came to UK with his parents, uh, Jewish family, um, but they spent time living in Denmark and he's been very active with the European Union. So who is this man and what is his real allegiance? You've no way of knowing, but it gets even better because if we bring in a bit of the uh, LinkedIn information, you find that he's had amazing jobs in the EU, special advisor as part of Condoleezza Rice's team. Uh, then he moves back into the cabinet. He's in with the European Commission. What is this man? Very, very special. Very, very special. Internationalist. Yeah, and he's used by David Cameron to warn off people who dare to challenge the internal political views. So I think the real story is about this sort of man, this calibre of individual, and how these people have been brought into the British system of government, totally unelected, of course, but they're now helping to drive some pretty vicious policy. Well, we get a bit more of uh, this story from The Sun, taken for a ride. Cameron Crony's covered up attempts to lobby for, uh, for Uber before Bojo's failed crackdown on the cab firm. Uh, this is because Boris Johnson did actually uh, try and at least halt their advances to some extent in order to protect uh, London cab drivers. But in this article, we get more of the story because this lady appears, Rachel Whetstone. She's now Uber senior vice president. But of course, she was former head of communications for Google when Cameron was clearly in bed with Google. And um, I think... Um, uh, relations over, over um, David Cameron's boy at one stage with uh, Rachel. Um, so it says that uh, it's emerged number 10 failed to give details under the freedom of information laws last year. Calls are now being made for an inquiry over the alleged cover-up and the government's link to the US taxi firm. Well, of course, it is a cover-up uh, because we already know that uh, freedom of information rules were not uh, followed. Mm. So who are these people? Just a few of Britain's unelected shadow government. Very dark. Um, people, public has no idea who these people are. They have no idea what their job uh, titles are, what their real responsibilities. Who are they accountable to? Anybody? We've no idea. No. Um, well, new week, uh, new NATO exercise, this time in Scotland. Uh, this is one of Europe's largest exercises, Joint, war, uh, joint Warrior. It's held twice a year in the spring and in the, in the autumn. Uh, and uh, so it runs until the, from now until the 6th of April. Uh, apparently it involves warships operating from Faslane and the Clyde and aircraft from Lossiemouth and Moray. Uh, and uh, they're going to have some live firing training, so that's good. 35 naval units and more than 50 aircraft are going to be used. So this is the biggest exercise in Europe, 35, uh, 50 aircraft and 35 boats. So it's huge, Brian. Um, uh, countries taking part, Denmark, Belgium, Estonia, France, Germany, Netherlands, Norway, Spain, Sweden, UK and the United States. Uh, thousands of personnel, uh, 16 Air Assault Brigade headquarters uh, and its associated battle group are going to be taking part in the land-based training, second para are going to be joined by troops from the Netherlands, Sweden, Sweden and the US. Um, so that's all good, but it gets better because running in parallel is uh, uh, Exercise Information Warrior, and this is going to be run by the uh, Royal Navy. It's the Royal Navy's large scale cyber war games. There you go. Did you take part in cyber war games, Brian? Uh, no, we... we, uh, we did they have we, computers in this? <laughs> yeah, they did, uh, we did have computers. I'm only smiling in that um, most of the communication problems were due to communicating throughout NATO, mm. uh, where, where we used to see some really amazing uh, delays in signal traffic, some signals arriving a few days late, but it's not really a problem. Um, well, the, the hint perhaps comes from the, uh, the, the, gra the logo there. Um, because uh, Information Warrior 17 is going to involve 
uh, testing artificial intelligence and the protection of warships and submarines during cyber attacks. But they, I think they're going to be running their little uh, speedboats that have uh, that are apparently autonomous. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm fascinated, Mike, to know what this is because um, a cyber attack on what on your communication system? Well, that's that's a pretty normal part of military policy, been going on for years. You have to maintain secure communications. Or are they su suggesting that somebody's going to get into the uh, computer systems on board the warships? And if that's the case, then uh, this ought to have been addressed uh, several years ago. So I, I think this is largely a publicity stunt in order to get um, cyber matters well, raised. Well, that, I think that's absolutely right. And, uh, you know, cyber right at the heart of all of NATO's public relations efforts at the moment. Uh, it's mm. being used as the sort of driving force for quite a lot of the internal change within NATO uh, and it's certainly being used as uh, the driving force for NATO EU military cooperation. Yeah. Uh, okay, we're going to end on this one. Now, we don't, uh, we don't normally like petitions as such, but I think this one is absolutely worthwhile and we need to, uh, we need to support it if we can. Uh, this is uh, from an organisation called Survivors of Child Sexual Abuse. And they're saying we demand government, Labour and Lib Dems investigate allegations that MPs raped children. They say we call on the government, the Labour Party and the Lib Dems to launch investigations into investigations that MPs and peers raped children or conspired to help others to do so during the administrations of John Major and Margaret Thatcher. Conservative Labour and Lib Dem MPs and peers are widely named by child abuse survivors and contemporary witnesses whose personal testimonies are mutually corroborate. Moreover, many of the MPs and peers whom child abuse survivors and witnesses identify are still alive. Some continue to sit in Parliament. Uh, the crimes in which they are implicated, covered up and buried. The ongoing independent inquiry into child sexual abuse and police investigations are essential and long overdue. Notwithstanding the CSA and police inquiries, the government, Labour Party and Lib Dems must launch their own investigations. These should seek out and analyse internal party files, historical complaints by party activists, whistleblowers and employees, and the private records and memories of MPs and peers, deceased, retires, retired and still serving, absent, proactive and exhaustive investigations by government and the main parties in Westminster, the uh, child sexual abuse inquiry and crime agencies may be unable to, unable to discover and consult these crucial sources for evidence of crimes long buried. Uh, do go and look at this page. It's on change.org. Uh, it give, goes into a lot of background and rationale. Uh, they highlight some hot spots. Islington being a key one. Islington Children's Homes in the 1980s under the oversight of Margaret Hodge, assisted by Keith Vaz. Uh, they talk about Richmond upon Thames Children's Homes of the same period. Uh, they talk about Westminster City Council, real estate in the same period. Uh, Lambeth Borough Council, Wales, Clwyd and Gwyneth Children's Homes. Uh, Kinkora in Belfast, Channel Islands, of course, uh, Oto and Garan, Garan, sorry, uh, and uh, and then they they name some names. Uh, the 1990s reports. These are they're talking about media reports. Uh, do name and implicate several prominent Conservative parliamentarians, including Peter Bottomley, Edward Lee, uh, Julian Lewis. Now, of course, they're not they are not naming these names. These are names that have arisen from ma mainstream media reports from the 1990s, which have basically been brushed under the carpet. Uh, and so there's a whole list of names uh, and uh, I do suggest you go and have a look at that and support that petition. Uh, incredible, isn't it? The people have obviously taken a lot of trouble there, Mike, to list out um, events that have been reported publicly, um, aside from witness testimony over the years. The government keeps telling us there is no child abuse in Westminster. This suggests otherwise. And I'd also like to say that our very brave Metropolitan Police uh, whistleblower, John Wedger, um, I'm able to use his full name now. Um, this was the man that did the wonderful interview with us uh, a few months ago, talking about what he had seen uh, relating to child abuse in London, the cover up by senior police officers, by local authorities, by child protection charities, and of course by politicians. Um, he is under tremendous pressure again. He's been put on half pay. Uh, he's basically being harassed 
uh, most of the time by the Metropolitan Police. Absolutely no action uh, taken by the policing minister. Um, no response from any of the other politicians. Um, this is what happens when a policeman stands up and actually tells the truth about what's been going on. So John Wedger, um, uh, keep him in your thoughts and prayers because he, he needs our support. I'm delighted to say, though, that there is still a teaming up of other policemen and women who've got similar information and they say they are not going to um, simply disappear into the background over this. But we need to help and support these people. And I'll also say to end our programme today, uh, please, <coughs> excuse me, can you help us promote the British Constitution Group event in Nottingham on the 22nd of April? This is a phenomenal opportunity to bring together people who are already out doing things to expose what's going on in UK. Um, what do we want to do? We want to bring people together to share knowledge, tactics, experience, and of course, just to have the fun and satisfaction of bringing good people together. So if you cannot come, that's very unfortunate, and we are disappointed at that, of course. But can you please help promote this uh, because we know there are many other people out there who still have not heard that this event is on and we need as much help as possible to uh, text it, email it, uh, letters, telephone, speak, whatever you can do, help us promote this event to make it the success that it needs to be. Thanks very much. That ends the news today. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye.